Thanks for being here. Uh, my name is Matt Pruitt. I'm Deputy Director of Radical Exchange, which is a nonprofit uh, building community around these kinds of egalitarian mechanism, mechanism design ideas. Um, so we've got a great panel today. Our, our first speaker is Ananya Chakravarti, who is a professor at Georgetown and uh, a board member of Radical Exchange. Uh, thanks very much. Lot, Matt. Is this loud enough? Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Um, I really wanted to thank Glenn and Atif and the Jules Rabinovitz Center for having me and to Balobi and to Nancy for making a very complicated journey very smooth here. <laughs> so thank you so much. Um, so today what I really want to talk about is my work for um, Radical Exchange. Um, and so I want to begin by, for those of you who are not familiar with us, and we're a very new um, organization. So what we are is we are a volunteer-driven community um, committed to imagining an alternative vision for a humane and equitable future. And key to this is harnessing the potential of um, insights from mechanism design in dialogue with a range of academic disciplines. So as you've seen, I'm a historian by training, but um, obviously, we have economists, we have computer science, we have philosophy, we have law, um, and really just a, we are open to every, um, every mode of producing knowledge and, and thinking about a better future. Um, and we do this not just as academics, but also in a connection with artists, with entrepreneurs and technologists, and with activists and public policy experts. Um, so we're an inclusive, open community, and we're you know, committed to promoting rich and meaningful connections across a wide range of people. Um, and we believe in diversity of opinion and representation across different ethnicities, races, gender, sexual orientations, religions, nationalities, abilities, socioeconomic and professional backgrounds. So our core values are obviously openness. Um, we are committed to facilitating a free exchange of ideas and an environment of thoughtful discourse. We're egalitarian. Um, we're all about horizontal and decentralized organization, as you will see. Um, and um, part of this is, of course, uh, to do with our commitment that hyper concentrations of wealth are neither natural or efficient, and that a more genuinely competitive market system would result, result in better and more equitable and um, humane allocations. Um, so we're also committed to every person's well-being and dignity, financial or otherwise, as a good in itself. And we're also committed to social innovation. And this, and it's, this is actually where the radical part of our foundation comes in, right? So we are um, we're willing to challenge sort of long-held assumptions about, um, about the necessity of things like private property as it is uh, conventionally understood, or the nation state, or methodological or political um, individualism. And our governance principles are reflect our core values, so diversity. Um, our group is uh, uh, a really motley crew, which is part of the fun of it. Um, we're also um, decentralized in how we operate. And um, uh, so a lot of decision making, we, we're committed to devolving outwards and in horizontal ways. Um, each person within the community as, um, as takes responsibility for what they can bring to the community. Um, it's, it's primarily driven by a social justice mission, and we treat each other as epistemic and social equals in our work. The community structure, um, the foundation itself is organized along four tracks. And so the track that I am responsible for, ideas and research, um, it, it includes the work of academics, public intellectuals, bloggers, researchers, members of think tanks, uh, nonfiction book authors, even literary critics. Um, my uh, colleague and friend Jennifer Marone, the artist, runs Arts and Communication. Mark Letter, who is the director for the Center for Innovation in Governance Research, he, he runs activism and governance. And Mamie Rydengold runs um, entrepreneurship and technology. We also encourage the formation of self-organized community groups or local chapters to educate and experiment with egalitarian market mechanisms. And we have chapters now all around the world. Um, and this includes also a recently founded community at RxC Students, which is um, probably one of our most exciting uh, developments, which aims to empower young people to envision 
experiment with and enact the future that they want. So what I want to focus today is the work that I have been doing and that um, we imagine the ideas and research uh, track actually uh, laying the foundation for. So what we really are want to do is uh, something very ambitious. We want to create a multidisciplinary knowledge and research cluster um, to explore and advance the main ideas around which radical exchange has coalesced. Now, in doing this, I draw inspiration from the historical development of two very different fields. One is queer studies, and I'll explain why in a minute. Um, and the other is data science. Now, queer studies has, I think, um, an absolutely fascinating history. So for those of you who want to delve deeper into the history of the discipline itself, um, I recommend Harry Minton's really beautiful book, Departing from Deviance. Um, but the, the, given the stigma around homosexuality and the, I, um, the classification of um, non-heterosexual sexualities as um, deviant or um, uh, socially in, um, medically uh, ab uh, aberrant in the 19th and early and 20th century. Um, it was the work of scholars, really, that gave voice to a community that was marginalized and um, invisible in much of Western society. Um, and so, and, and some, and much of the scholarship was done almost undercover. So if you think back to the early 20th century in America, the work of um, the lesbian um, anthropologist Mildred Barry Berryman, who did work in Utah looking at the lives of lesbian women there, or the work of um, the lesbian researcher who went by this um, pseudonym Jan Gay and worked with the um, psychiatrist George Henry, who, who actually ended up uh, promoting a fairly negative view of uh, homosexuality in his work, but actually couldn't hide the fact that the research that she produced showed uh, lesbian and gay uh, men uh, proud of inhabiting the sexualities they have. So what gives me inspiration from queer studies is the deep connection that queer studies always had between activism and scholarship, and the idea that um, scholarship was deeply connected to issues of justice. And, um, and social good. Um, and, and more importantly, that, that that fostered a very close relationship between the members of the academy and the, the social constituents that they spoke for. Um, also, queer studies from the beginning was multidisciplinary, right? So it was um, psychiatrists, it was anthropologists, it was historians, everybody was involved in um, carving out this discipline. Um, and of course, this discipline engendered possibly in many ways the fastest social movement of the 20th century in, ter in terms of overturning societal attitudes towards non-heterosexual sexuality. The second discipline that I draw inspiration from is data science. And this seems uh, very different from queer studies, but I'll explain why I think this is also a good model for us. For one, data science brought together a very old discipline, statistics, with a new one. Uh, computer science. Um, so starting in the 60s, really, um, you started to see the call among um, statisticians for thinking about their discipline in um, genuinely new way ways. So people like Peter Naur or John Tukey um, started to imagine what became the foundations of data science. What I find inspiring about the, um, about the field is how quickly it established itself as a new mode of creating knowledge within the, um, within the academy. And part of it was actually a very interesting um, movement within the statistical um, science of challenging what Leo Breiman calls the, the two cultures. Um, one that was sort of theoretical and empty of content in some ways, and one that was actually data-driven. And, and, and actually that, the data-driven culture actually allowed statisticians to um, comment on and engage with ex uh, social processes in new ways. Um, and the field established itself um, very quickly through um, work done by academics in, in very interesting ways. So founding journals, um, uh, pushing for the, um, for the um, recognition of this as a new field um, through, you know, uh, important lectures, um, 
in, in, in places around the world from Japan to India to Michigan, um, and as well as um, focusing on uh, a wide variety of real world applications, which then led eventually to um, it being called the sexiest new discipline of knowledge, which is very weird. And I don't really want radical exchange to become a sexy discipline, but that's me. Um, that being said, so the, those are our sort of um, inspirations for uh, how we want to imagine this research cluster and how we're actually going about doing this um, has, um, takes the following form. The one, because we are open to every mode of producing knowledge and we don't privilege one particular mode over the other, in order to maintain coherence, we, we seek that coherence in, um, through themes of research that we hope will bring people together. We also want to provide avenues for new research um, and platforms for it. And so the first is, our, um, is what we hope will become an annual conference. Um, and the first one is being held in this March in Detroit. And please talk to me afterwards about tickets and scholarship if you're interested. Um, the second um, thing that we're working on right now is to create a, um, intellectual commons, uh, and which we hope will actually provide a model for a completely new way of publishing and sharing research in the, um, in the academy. And the third thing that we're committed to is nurturing and empowering students, which means that we are interested in pedagogical experiments that um, play around with the ideas that we're um, exploring, as well as fostering a very close relationship between um, um, the ideas and research track and RxE students. So the first theme so of five that really um, we think um, our ideas coalesce around um, is economics. And here, again, we, that's obviously very broad. We're not trying to take over the Department of Economics. <laughs> there are very specific um, research um, um, avenues that we're interested in. So, for example, we're interested in the effects of monopolistic control of productive resources, so the role of private property or corporate structure in creating and maintaining monopolies. We're interested in radical markets, and we're generally interested in investigating inequality. Um, and so to give you an example, one of the panels that we will be featuring at the um, conference in Detroit uh, called Regulating Markets, we'll have Fiona Scott Morton, the Theodore Nuremberg Professor of Economics at Yale, um, speaking on how can antitrust enforcement help improve wealth and inequality and economic dynamism. We also have Juliana Elevator Dominguez, um, she's a professor of law at um, Universidad de São Paulo. Um, speaking on the interplay between competition and international trade as a way of thinking about welfare in developing countries. Um, James Niels Rosenquist, for example, he's a psychiatrist and an economist by training. He's actually thinking about the ways in which we need to regulate the attentional economy in an age of smartphones um, as in the way that we might regulate other addictive substances. The second research theme that we're interested in is, is broadly conceived as politics. And again, there are specific things that we're interested in within that domain. So one of the things that we're committed to, given our open structure and ethos, is imagining alternatives to current paradigms of the political left and right, and especially in this age of depolarization. We're also interested in things like the role of the state in the monopolization of productive resources or state capture by monopolies. We're interested in new mechanisms of radical democracy, uh, like quadratic voting. Um, so again, uh, this is another one of our scheduled panels, um, uh, New Strategies for Democratic Governance. Alicia Holland, who is a professor here in political science, um, is going to be speaking about her research in Colombia. Um, and um, Daniel Stone is actually a, a track member of Radical Exchange Foundation. He is going to be describing a new app that he's proposing to burst political news echo chambers called Media Trades. Um, Daniel Konovet, um, who is uh, actually not um, a, a, an academic as such, but has a very, very interesting paper on thinking about um, decentralized capital allocation by budgeting boxes. And then we have two undergraduate students who have a truly impressive paper 
um, from Stanford um, with using data on Stanford's campus, on, um, you know, consensus rule to show that actually unanimity rule is not optimal, whereas quadratic voting is at least the better outcome. The third research theme that we're interested in is, again, broadly conceived of space. And here we're interested in things like um, imagining new modes of human settlement. So for example, my colleague Mark Letter is very interested in charter cities and um, um, we have very interesting talks scheduled in Detroit on projects and experiments like that in the developing world. We're interested in human migration policy and understanding worker mobility and its role in creating just and equitable societies. And we're also really interested in thinking beyond the 19th century paradigm of the nation. Um, so again, this is another one of our panels for Detroit, and here you can see again the um, wide variety of disciplines. Um, so my colleague uh, Katie Benton Cohen at Georgetown, she's going to be speaking about her new book um, on the Dillingham Commission and the, the sort of um, the invention of the problem of immigration in the U.S. Um, that began with that commission. Um, Mohamed uh, Mizanur Rahman, who's Associate Professor of Gulf Studies at Qatar, he, he's, um, he's one of the few experts who works on South-South migration, um, a very overlooked form of um, worker mobility. Um, and he's going to be speaking about his research there. We have Alexander Kustov, who's also um, a postdoctoral fellow here at Princeton on his research on how and what would get voters to support immigration, as well as a kind of philosophical paper um, that proposes a Rortian vocabulary to, um, uh, to replace how we talk about immigration. Um, and this paper is especially interesting because it's co-authored between a faculty member and three undergraduate students at Wayne State. Um, the fourth theme that we're interested in is uh, collective action. Um, and this includes things like um, labor movements for the digital economy. So if we, if we think about data as a form of labor, then how do we organize or um, advocate for the proper treatment of digital workers? Um, we're interested in thinking about, um, thinking beyond methodological and political individualism. And we're really interested in imagining some decentralized and horizontal modes of community work. Um, so again, one of our speakers at the conference here, um, she's going to be speaking, Zoe, uh, on market design and the tragedy of the commons, of the managed commons, and why we need to think about um, the ethical implications of market design. Um, and Lyle Jeremy Rubens is going to be speaking about his research um, uh, on um, uh, a very interesting uh, genealogy. Uh, within abolitionist thought in the United States of, um, of thinking about how we can found the ideas behind radical exchange um, and give it a kind of new intellectual genealogy. Um, Stephen Squibb, who is a PhD candidate in English, um, shows a, through a close reading how sort of mis Hayek's misreading of Adam Smith has led to very poor <laughs> um, policy outcomes in some ways. And Mariel Gross, uh, who's a bioethics fellow at Johns Hopkins, um, has a very interesting proposal for treating health data as labor um, within this uh, panel. The fifth and final theme that we're interested in is broadly conceived as identity. So, um, so things like what does identity mean in the digital economy? Um, what would data dignity or personal data um, look like? Um, um, what would it mean to forge new kinds of political identities to combat both polarization and radicalization and to essentially think about identity within pure plural societies and new forms of uh, political affiliation like Glenn's proposal for liberal radicalism. Um, and so we have a couple of panels that looks at these themes. Again, we have another one of our speakers here who's going to be speaking, Nicole, on a social approach to decentralized identity. Her presentation yesterday touched a little bit on that. Um, uh, Ehud Shapiro, who's a professor of computer science at Wiseman Institute of Science, is going to be um, talking about a very interesting project that he's developing um, to think about how, again, also how to create uh, decentralized forms of identity and, and, uh, and cooperation. Um, and, uh, uh, and a similar project from uh, Jose Para Moyano, the University of Detroit. 
Um, we also have Timnit Gebru, um, who's a technical co-lead and uh, of the ethical artificial intelligence team at Google, um, who's going to be talking about um, bias and algorithms and um, thinking about um, creating um, forms of identification and data sets to combat that. Um, and we have a really interesting project by a, um, candidate, a um, Bachelor of Fine Arts candidate, um, so an undergraduate student um, on cybernetic reemergence within blockchain networks. Um, it's kind of an art and an ethnographic project. It's really, really interesting. Um, and Sarah Grace Mansky um, has done ethnographic research within blockchain communities to kind of think about the um, potential of distributed ledger technologies and, 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 and affecting labor markets. So I hope that that gives you a sense of the kinds of um, projects that we are interested in, that we're already trying to sort of bring together um, and put into conversation at the conference. Um, and, and generally the kind of, um, you know, rigorous but um, multidisciplinary research that we're interested in, um, uh, in fostering. Um, so that brings us to the next um, pillar of the um, ideas and research track, which is uh, the students. And this is, in many ways, we believe that the long-term success of our plan is, depends first and foremost upon our students, both graduate, but especially at the undergraduate level. So we're interested in fostering pedagogical experiments aligned with our research interests and principles and projects and events to help empower students to make the most of their educational opportunities and to basically foster future leaders of radical exchange. Um, so one of the projects that we're going to be showcasing as part of Project Exchange at um, our conference in Detroit is um, the Hungarian economist Tibor Liska has uh, run a set of economic experiments in student camps called Liska Land. Um, and so Liska Land, um, which was developed during communist rule in Hungary to demonstrate that an egalitarian society can operate in a decentralized and self-regulating way. Um, and to run the novel, a model, solutions must be found to the basic functions traditionally provided by the centralized state. Um, and so the, the, this is going to give students an opportunity to actually try out Liska Land. And so we're really interested in the, these kinds of new, exciting pedagogical experiments. And you know, if you have ideas, please do come and talk to us. Um, and we can think about how we can help them um, that happen. We also really want to encourage young people to attend. And so we're offering a range of scholarships at our conference. So if you're interested, please do let me know. Um, and to make the most of the distinguished academics and researchers who will be in attendance at our conference, we will organize mentoring and networking events specifically for student attendees. Um, the last thing that we're currently working on is this new intellectual commons. And um, how am I doing for time? But Okay, perfect. Okay, good. So we want to provide a platform for rigorous um, peer-reviewed scholarly work across all disciplines that pertain to our set of intellectual concerns. Um, but for all of us who are working academics, I'm sure you all have frustrations with current models of um, publication. So I'll share mine and my field um, papers in top journals that I have published and have taken routinely between two and a half and three years to come out, which is super fun for the tenure clock. Um, we also know, at least I know, that um, peer review is damn hard work. And it's really frustrating that then uh, that work is neither acknowledged or rewarded in any way, but um, you know, journal publication companies can then put up expensive paywalls and make it difficult to access that scholarship. And I, for one, am absolutely sick of it. <laughs> so part of what Radical Exchange Intellectual Commons is trying to do is to address these kinds of problems. And especially in certain fields, there's also issues of gatekeeping, right? So if you, if you manage to kind of end up um, with a certain intellectual school in charge of the most prestigious journal, journals, then you're actually ending up with problems of, you know, not allowing other forms of scholarship into the um, general discourse. So in order to um, address all of those frustrations, which I, I don't think are specific to history, and I'm sure it's a much more generalized problem, we're proposing a new model that um, replaces the traditional owner of authorship with a partial common ownership model. 
um, in which everybody who has been important to the production of an intellectual product, which includes peer reviewers, is counted as a partial common owner of that intellectual product, right? Um, and the second thing is that the process of peer review itself is transparent, rapid, and participatory. So that um, essentially the way this will work is that if, um, so say you submit a paper to um, the platform um, of the group of editors within the field that you submit in, um, you have to have two editors who are willing to support the project. And that puts it up on the platform. That opens the review process. And basically, um, anybody with credentials on the platform can then uh, either sign in support or in dissent of the project and give detailed reviews. The, the reviews will then be ranked without um, a regard to whether the comments are positive or negative. But essentially, it rewards early and substantive engagement. Um, and the people whose reviews end up shaping and changing that intellectual product then get counted among the list of partial common owners of that intellectual product. So the peer review process rewards you by basically making you a partial author of the intellectual product. And the whole process happens much more quickly, much more rapidly, and transparently. Um, so we're in the process of building that with um, Lucas, actually, at Wireline. So um, this seems like a good moment to end. Thank you very much for your attention and time. Uh, I think maybe we have time for like one or two questions for Nanya before we move on to Lucas. Okay, yeah, that's fine. Let's, um, our next speaker is uh, Lucas Geiger, uh, co-founder of Wireline, which is uh, one of the most interesting um, companies out there building um, uh, blockchain and, and other products uh, inspired by uh, mechanism design. So. Thanks, Matt. And thanks, Atif. Thanks, Glenn, Nancy, and Pallavi for your wonderful hospitality. Um, so I'm Lucas. I am a co-founder at Wireline. And at Wireline, we're building new public infrastructure for the internet. And I'm here to recruit players for a game. But I probably need to give a little bit of an introduction on Web3. So I'm going to start with Glitter. Uh, Ian Meyer is a cryptography researcher at Cornell describes online data as glitter. Once you get it out of its container, it has maximal entropy. It's everywhere, and you can't put it back in. And in fact, while I was working on this presentation, I actually found a piece of glitter on my hand from a Christmas card um, earlier in the year. So the thing about glitter and the thing about data is that we only have one way of solving it today. We have this, what I, I'm going to call for this presentation, the data silo paradigm. And basically what that means is we lock up the data with different users in different silos, rather different operators in different silos with different keys, which means you have multiple copies everywhere, and you need to trust the operator of those silos to do the right thing. And we know there are side effects to that. So we know from Ed Snowden that the NSA has backdoors into our larger platforms. Uh, we also have things like the Equifax uh, hack where every Every adult uh, in America has their social security and, and credit information uh, taken somewhere, and we actually don't know where it went. So um, a lot of the Web3 activity started around at the time that Snowden made his revelations. What is Web3 specifically? Um, it's a way that we have today to build applications without the data silo. And this is a really new thing, and it, it is really only going to come into being really this year. So I wanted to make everybody aware of the, the different uh, applications that we have for it and um, the, the power that we have to maybe create new business models around it. So specifically Web3, we're, we're talking about a different set of infrastructures, different set of protocols, uh, and different types of applications that can be built. Decentralized data storage is one application. You could have uh, a pool of computers that, uh, that contains all of storage, similar to how Amazon S3, if you're familiar with that, or Dropbox work. And you can have people come in and in and out of 
providing storage, and you can have people use that storage over time. That's an example of a type of Web3 infrastructure. But it's going to affect identity, payments, compute, data, messaging, uh, a, a lot of things. And so we're now at a point where we can launch this type of technology out there, but the trouble is no one actually cares about security and privacy, at least not enough to pay for it. And so we've had conversations this week about this. Um, we have a couple different ways of maybe addressing this for, for the public, how we can get uh, more secure technologies and, and privacy preserving technologies into, uh, in, into our applications that consumers use. Uh, roughly, it's, we're on, on one side, we're, we're saying let the market decide. We can have different um, technologies come and, and killer apps come and the market will decide those are valuable. Um, on the other side, we, we want to regulate the companies through activism and, uh, and, and politics. So I don't believe any of these are going to get us close to where we need to be um, in, in the transition from data silos. But let me try to uh, invalidate these quickly. Um, on the market side, let the markets decide, we, there's this particularity of how cloud applications work in that they create a lot of benefits for users, a lot of uh, consumer surplus, but they're free. And the fact of them being free is, uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a strange, it, it does strange things to how we reason about products. So Dan Ariely, behavior economist, did a, lot, a, number of uh, uh, a number of studies on this. And it turns out we have a very hard time making rational decisions that maximize the utility uh, for us. And so, Web3 products are not going to be subsidized. And I don't think it's credible for us to think uh, that we're going to be able to compete um, with, with these products or that we're, um, in, in the face of free products from, uh, from Google for online search and email. But there's the other side of that as well, which is it's hard for the platforms to reason about free products as well and to, and to change that market. But effectively, uh, that's... That's one game that we can play, and I don't have a lot of confidence in it. The other game we can play is the, what I call a cat and mouse game, which is basically trying to enforce um, a, a, a set of behaviors from, uh, from the companies and try to enforce their uh, compliance with our data. So we don't have a tremendous amount of positive experience in this. So last year, Europe began um, regulated data. And so they launched the GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation. Um, and so I'll just keep it brief, but I don't have a lot of confidence that it is enforceable. Because if you actually look into the text, uh, the language is quite vague. Um, there are lots of exceptions. And you're going to leave it up to every country to regulate it. So I think it's, a, it's an interesting... Um, it's, it's an interesting activity to try and get us to be aware of this, uh, of the issues with data privacy. But unfortunately, I don't think it moves us closer to having secure applications and private applications because it's not enforceable. But even if it were, um, even if it were enforceable, we have an, exp an experiment in the United States around data privacy in the healthcare space. And the issue with healthcare um, was that you know our doctors, uh, rather insurance, could get access to a lot of our medical records, and that was a, a disadvantage to a lot of uh, uh, consumers. So we, the politicians, created HIPAA, and the outcome of HIPAA is yeah, okay, it's harder for our doctors to give data to um, to insurance companies, but we also have very bad coordination between our doctors. So none of my doctors know what each one is doing. So in a sense, we have a worse healthcare product because of that. We have worse healthcare um, and, and maybe worse healthcare outcomes. So if we think that uh, privacy and, and, and data security is enforceable uh, and, and politicians can create sensible laws, we should absolutely expect to have worse products. So those are the games that we can play today, but in the spirit of radical markets, I want to propose that there might be a synthesis, there might be a different kind of game that we can play that gets us closer to the security and privacy needs that we have, in an abundance of privacy coupled with an abundance of commerce. And this is only really 
I think, going to be able to be unlocked because of Web3. It's, it's the fact that we're going to be able to move from data silos into another way of building applications. But for that, I think we need to test our intuitions on what businesses want from being online to begin with. Um, so we have some intuitions about consumers. We, we've been talking about that so far. But businesses, I don't think, are necessarily willing participants in, these, in the data silo paradigm. And I don't think they're always willing participants in uh, using advertisement as a state of the art for acquiring customers. Um, data silos are liabilities for a lot of companies. You think of uh, healthcare, finance, education. Um, having detailed customer data can be a liability. And compliance is expensive. Uh, and in the, in the event of a data breach, you, you can have a class action lawsuit against you. But um, so if you think of a number of companies, certain types of companies, if they could n not have access or rather not have custody of the customer data and still do business as usual, I think a lot of businesses would take that option. So I, I think our intuitions might, might not be right that they're trying to hoard uh, customer data. Um, and on the other side of it, well, what are, what are businesses trying to do online anyway? So my way of thinking about this is that the only thing businesses are trying to do online is get matched with a customer. And today, advertisement, online advertisement is a state of the art of matching. Um, now, Google's genius was being able to convince every company in the world that they needed an ad budget. And um, it, I think a lot, of, uh, a lot of businesses are not willing participants in that game either. So is there a way that we could start to think about uh, bringing businesses and customers uh, together in a different kind of game. Um, I'm going to propose a thought experiment right now that we could think of um, the businesses and consumers not as agents in a market for a good, but using Al Roth's matching markets uh, ideas, how are they two entities trying to find each other in a market? So let's uh, try an example. Um, I, nothing aggra aggravates me more than online travel booking. So, uh, and I travel a lot. I travel about every month for a conference. So if we look into the future, 10 years from now, how would we want our travel booking to look like? Um, my expectation would be that I would like to put a calendar invitation for a conference on my online calendar. And a few minutes later, I have my airplane, hotel, ground transportation, conference tickets, all sorted out and paid for. So that's my expectation in 10 years' time. But today, that's a, a fantastical situation. We wouldn't be able to do that credibly um, with, with, the, with any privacy or security uh, guarantees. I'm just spraying glitter all over the internet. That's going to happen. So what would that, let, let, how could we create a more private version of that? So, this is, this is a hypothesis, it's just a, a, let's have a theoretical computer. Let's call this a zero-knowledge computer. And this computer can accept information from me, but it can't give me back any information. So I can feed it some of my preferences. I can tell it, look, I'm going to travel these days. I'm going to go to this place. Um, these are my dietary preferences. I don't want to fly on Delta. And I can't that information cannot be leaked out. Let's just assume that that's possible. On the other side, the travel company is going to say, look, I'm looking for business class customers. Uh, I want them to pay this amount. I want them to wear black sweaters, and I don't sell uh, Delta tickets anyway. So what's the outcome of that? Um, if that was possible and we couldn't leak any data and it's sufficiently anonymized, the outcome of that is that I have a perfect travel package. And the travel company has a perfect customer. So this is a big win for me because I'm obsessive about this. It'll take me two days to book all of that stuff. And I'll end up canceling a bunch of um, and But more importantly, I have no regrets because I know I got the best ticket. Uh, and on the other side, we have, we have the travel company. And for them, I think the imp impact is a little more profound because advertisement is not a good game for travel company. So for every $1,000 the travel company puts into ads, maybe only 5% convert. And of that 5%, they actually go and they search online for the ticket, then another 5% convert. And then that goes into a shopping cart 
but then maybe 20% of that amount converts. And then if nobody cancels, then, then you can have you, you on the passenger. So in this experiment, um, the travel company actually got the perfect customer and it has a much bigger channel. So it has, hypothetically, everybody's calendar information and a, a really big funnel to match people perfectly. So this is just a thought experiment, but, um, and, and you can say, well, you know, that information is not really private to me. I don't really care about that information. But let's talk about real cases of, of industries that are also not suited for uh, advertisement and that have problems with private, private data. So in healthcare, we could imagine such a zero knowledge um, computer telling us what doctor to see given a condition. Now, I wouldn't want that data commingled with my travel data. And the same thing for uh, financial data. I want to get matched with good financial products, but I don't want my, uh, my income and, and net assets being sprayed into the internet like glitter. So this is a thought experiment of the types of games that we can do with Web3. So this, I, I'm, not, I'm not advocating that this is the answer. These are the types of games that I want us to think about where there's an abundance of privacy with an abundance of commerce. So now, what do we do if we want to get there in 10 years? What do we need to start building now? Well, we need to start building some public goods that the internet never built in the 90s. Um, and some of these goods are going to be compatible with Web2, with the cloud today, and some of them are going to be greenfield. Um, now, for the example that I described, we're, we need to get some guarantees from these applications and from this infrastructure. We need it to be um, verifiable. We need to make sure that the travel agency and myself are getting, are getting the best deal. We need to make sure it's permissionless so that we're not excluding anybody from this. We need it to be neutral. So we need to make sure that there isn't uh, an agent that is somehow manipulating and making and, make, and preferring a certain side. So to do that, we're, we're only now beginning to develop technology for creating decentralized um, infrastructure that can be neutral. So what are, what are folks working on in the, in the Web3 world? Uh, payment is a big thing. So how do we create native payment to the internet that is inside the protocol, inside the transactions? Uh, decentralized identity. How do we create self-sovereign identity that we can, like, we can access any application and not uh, be dependent on Google or Facebook to access stuff? And then more obscure things like routing and application messaging, all of these are going to require new infrastructure. And, and the characteristics that we want from it is for it to be a public good and to be sustainable and to be resilient to attack. So given that we want to build these public goods, uh, this audience knows that public goods are a very difficult thing to deal with. It's difficult to fund, difficult to maintain, difficult to make decisions around it. So we need mechanism designers to come and work with. So at Wireline, we have a mechanism design team where we're applied um, designers. Um, we have mathematicians, uh, computer scientists, economists, uh, legal scholars working on this problem, and hackers. We need hackers for this type of. So the way I think about these, uh, these, these infrastructures is, is with a that they have a hierarchy of needs. So at the base layer, they have something I call the physiological need, which is we want to make sure that the network is working. So let's use an example of a decentralized storage uh, uh, service. How do we get people to provide hardware and storage to this network? They can come in and out of the network, and people can retrieve their data even, even if one of the, the nodes fell off. That's a difficult type of problem. That's more of a computer science problem uh, coupled with, with uh, distributed consensus but with some mechanism design. The second layer is, is what, I'm call, what I call the social layer, which, where is, we, is where we have commerce and other interactions. So how do we get people, how do we get the right applications built with this storage? Do we want to, so we start with the question, do we want to reward certain types of applications to be built with storage? Do we want photo applications or do we want different types of applications to be built? And then the last layer is a governance layer, which is, uh, which I think is the hardest uh, part of what we're building, and, um, and I, think, I think there's a lot of room for improvement there. But the important part of mechanism design uh, for what we're doing is that, and this is the important message to the economists here, is that 
uh, mechanism design for this space is not a nice to have. It's not an optimization. It's not the way I think of spectrum auctions where we're improving allocation. A, a failure in the economic model and the failure in the mechanism is devastating for the network. So if there is, and more so than a technology failure, because with a technology failure, eventually your users come back as, long, as soon as you get back online. If people lose confidence in your economic model, you lost, you lost the entire network. You lost people providing hardware. You lost people providing commerce and governance. So we need, we need help from, uh, from mechanism design. The trouble with the internet is that nobody knows your dog on the internet. And so the internet is a very dangerous space for mechanism designers. Um, a lot of the classic mechanisms don't uh, help us uh, achieve our goals in, uh, on the internet. We, we, in, at Wireline, we call this the Sybil verse. So it's a universe of Sybil attackers. Anybody can add uh, any amount of, of users into your system and, and attack them in, in a number of ways. So we can think of Vickery auctions, for example. Um, the last two people uh, could, could be uh, the same person could be colluding. Um, the the Al, Al Roth's matching mechanisms probably wouldn't work because we don't have a, num uh, a set number of participants and we could create art an artificial number of participants. Now, the pushback we get from mechanism designers is, well, these differences are really very marginal. I mean, it really might just be a few cents on, on, in the Vickery auction that, that went wrong. But the trouble with the internet is, is that every one cent gap you leave in your game becomes a million or $10 million attack because you can just amplify that by creating more bots and, uh, and, and attacking the system. But again, more so than losing the money is losing the confidence in the system. So we need to, we, we need, you know, it's not, it's not optional and it has to be, and it has to be um, pretty airtight. So this brings me to uh, my, basically my last slide. And this is about governance. Um, just like a number of mechanisms don't work, um, a, a number of, of our governance mechanisms won't work in the decentralized space. So voting doesn't work. So the, one, the idea that we have a one person, one vote, absolutely can't work in these systems and on the internet because you can't prove that someone isn't creating multiple identities to influence the vote. So the state of the art with governance is doing something like a shareholder vote, where you take your stake of the network and you vote with that. But unfortunately, that also doesn't work because buying votes in this space on the internet and on the blockchain is trivial. And we can do it now without a trace. There's some really interesting papers on how you can attack and not leave a trace and verifiably prove that the person voted the right way. So governance is unsolved. We're at square one. And I think this is, this is a, a, a big area of improvement. So my request. This is uh, an area that is high stakes. I think the future of security and privacy is going to come out of this work, and possibly the future of commerce comes out of this work. Uh, we need all sorts of disciplines to join us. Uh, there are lots of puzzles, and that's a good sign. Because as an entrepreneur, you're always worried about being ahead or behind the, the timing. Um, and, but now we're in the thick of it. So a lot of puzzles to solve. I'm not going to solve it. I'd like you to join us. Thank you. All right, let's save all the questions for the end. Um, our, our next speaker is uh, Aparna Krishnan, who is a, uh, a Teal Fellow and the co-founder of Mechanism Labs. And uh, thanks, Aparna. Hey everyone, thanks to uh, thanks Glenn and Ati for having me, um, and thanks Nancy and Pallavi for throwing this awesome conference. Um, a little too loud. Okay, is this better? Okay. So today my talk is going to be about mechanism design and decentralized finance. To me, decentralized finance is is kind of similar to the way that 
the internet was to information sharing. So the blockchain is going to enable a whole new future for finance and different kinds of financial services. Um, and today my talk is gonna talk a little bit about that. So why does blockchain technology, especially Ethereum, represent a new paradigm for mechanism design? Well, let's start with different kinds of virtual currencies. So pre-Bitcoin, there were several attempts at creating a currency for the internet. Um, there were attempts at creating something called uh, e-gold, Liberty Cash, um, all of these very, very cool and promising ideas, but all of them shut down at some point. Either the companies went bankrupt or the US government shut them down because there was a lot of illegal use of these currencies. Um, which is why Bitcoin is really interesting because this is the first time you can have a currency of the internet that cannot be shut down. But let's take a step back. Why do you need a currency of the internet? Why do you need this sort of value transfer to happen on the internet? Think of how easy it is for you today to search up someone and send them an email. Now think of how easy it is for you to search up someone and send them some money. Um, the processes are very different and sending someone money if they're halfway across the world is probably gonna take you a few different apps, um, getting across a few different regular hurdles. It's by no means the same process. Um, and what a currency of the internet can enable is these kinds of cross-border payments and a lot of other cool new things. Um, but Bitcoin provides you a currency of the internet. What does Ethereum do? Well, Ethereum essentially allows you to do this thing called smart contract programming. And smart contracts essentially enable you to write all of these kinds of complex financial derivatives or financial contracts that you previously could only have Goldman or all of these existing financial institutions craft. So this means that any two people in the world can now craft really complex financial contracts between themselves. Um, and this basically enables different kinds of investment opportunities, things that previously only accredited investors could do, they're now democratizing to different people across the world. Um, I really like this quote by Nadav, where he talks about how the internet itself is borderless, but different countries and different financial institutions impose this border which is what prevents us from having the same kind of borderless payments as we do with borderless transfer, uh, transfer of information. So let's take an example of why this could be important. So here is an example of an auction contract written by consensus. Um, so if you are a mechanism designer and you're trying out a new idea, in the regular world, if you wanted to test out your new auction contract, how would you go about doing it? You would probably have an experiment, probably set up an event like a live auction, um, gather a few hundred people, have them come, come to your auction and then uh, conduct the experiment in, in real life. Um, but now with the blockchain, you have the ability to run these sort of auctions using just a smart contract. All you need to do is plug and play a few pieces of, a few lines of code. This is just like a 40 line contract. And you have access to millions of users who are already out there who are trading, um, who provide you this sort of innate liquidity. What Ethereum's created is this sort of economic experimentation tool for mechanism designers. Um, all you have to do is modify existing contracts and existing code, and voila, you have an experiment audience right there. Um, what's cooler is if in the traditional world, you want it to run multiple different experiments, you decide the first one doesn't work, you wanna change something around, you have to run the whole process all over again. But with a smart contract, all you need to do is modify a couple lines of code, upgrade the contract, and the experiment is still up and running. Um, 
The blockchain provides you huge access to liquidity that previously you would have to go searching for if you had to set up such an experiment. And I think the biggest benefit is low fees to experimentation. Previously, if you wanted to write a financial contract, um, it would probably not make a lot of sense if you ran it, ran an experiment for a few dozen people. Um, you would have various regulatory hurdles, you would have to convince various different institutions, and then maybe have like Goldman write out this contract for you. But right now, if you had to deploy a contract on Ethereum, it just costs you $5 of gas fee and maybe some time to write up the code. Um, so I really like this quote, which captures the power of decentralized finance. Harbor is trying to tokenize real world assets and have them tradable on Ethereum. The benefits of this are cheaper costs to securitize assets and more global liquidity pools, with the latter possibly being the biggest benefit. In the real world, if you had to build something like eGold, imagine a world where the blockchain didn't exist. You would have to create these liquidity providers. You would need to create um, a way for people to store on-chain securities. Uh, you would have to create a way for people to trade them. But because the blockchain exists, all of these different tools exist for you. All you need to do is write a small contract and deploy it on Ethereum. So let's do a quick case study um, in mechanism design, looking at Augur as our example. So the goal with Augur is to create a prediction market system where you don't rely on any single trusted party. Um, so how would you go about designing something like this? Well, the idea is you have market creators. So anyone in the world can be a market creator. They have to stake some initial amount of money to be a market creator. Um, this market creator then decides the event, the date, the time, um, and also puts up some stake in case their market is, is like badly worded or doesn't make sense. Um, now, anyone else in the world can vote on this market. All they need to do is buy a set of tokens. Um, and when you buy a set of tokens, you get one yes and one no token. Um, so for example, if someone created a market uh, on, is Zuckerberg going to win 2020 elections? Um, you could, if you put up one ETH, you get a set of yes and no tokens, and then you can trade these um, on, depending on like who's willing to purchase what for what value. Um, and at the end of at the end of the uh, event, so you have this sort of settlement system, and everyone who voted on yes or if yes was the outcome, um, they get paid out one ETH and everyone else who voted no loses the money that they staked. But how does the actual outcome of what happened in the real world get fed into the blockchain? That's where the concept of oracles come in. Um, and so oracles are these different entities who each put up some stake to be oracles and they all vote on what actually happened in the real world. So if Trump did win the election, um, they vote yes. If he didn't win the election, they vote no. And based on what majority votes, majority of the articles vote, um, you either end up, everyone who voted in the minority loses money and the money from the minority pool gets redistributed to the majority. Um, so this is where like voting and incentives come in. Um, of course, oracles kind of assume that actors are rational, self-interested, and which is why the minority of people would be slashed. But this also opens up the platform to a lot of different kinds of attacks. You have um, what happens if a group of people decide to collude together, or what happens if um, you have these kinds of bribing attacks where someone says, hey, if you vote in the minority and you vote no, um, I will pay you an extra five cents. That can change the whole equilibrium of the game. 
and cause everyone to vote in minority in what they think is minority, but end up in majority. And that's where a lot of these interesting mechanism design problems come in. But taking a step back, what can something like Augur be used for? Well, any sort of financial contract that, that has a binary outcome is one example. Um, we live in a world with a lot of uncertainty. Um, some things we can predict, some things we cannot, but prediction markets on average have shown to be um, good ways of knowing what the future is. And so Augur is a great way to create markets on things that we so far cannot. When you have a centralized prediction market, you cannot create markets on like certain things unless the market maker lets you do that. But now you have a global pool of liquidity um, and this essentially allows you to, in a way, predict things that you in the past couldn't predict. Um, so one example of where you could use Augur is insurance. So one kind of prediction market that someone could create is Will there be a magnitude seven earthquake in San Francisco before March 2020? Um, and if, for example, there is an earthquake, all those who bet no are hedged against um, whatever they would have lost. And in this way, you've essentially disintermediated a whole industry of insurance. Um, another example is Farmers in India could create a market saying, will there be sufficient rain in, in this area in Punjab? Um, and betting no is another way of hedging your risks. So I really like this quote by Joey, where he says, imagine being able to develop new financial markets that previously needed a multi-million dollar bespoke contract designed by Goldman, but with a few points and clicks. Not only will that happen, but it's also already here. It happens to be slow and expensive and hard to use, just like the internet was in 1992. But fast forward a few years, it'll be fast, cheap, and easy to use. And all you need is some little clever bits of mechanism design. But has Augur been successful? Well, Augur, reached its peak on November 14th when there was 14K ETH locked in, which was over $2.5 million locked into this contract, despite this platform being incredibly hard to use. Now, to me, the blockchain is really, really early. It's probably where the internet was um, in like the 70s or something. Um, and today we are, in a at a point where people are locking up $2.5 million in Augur. Um, Vale is another project that's recently been funded by Sequoia Paradigm and other different companies to make the user experience easier around using Augur. So has Augur been successful? It is in the process. Um, and I think if anything, What's interesting is that this decentralized financial ecosystem is reaching people who are on the fringes of today's financial ecosystem, who may not have bank accounts, who may not have access to financial services, um, who are in restricted areas, um, or maybe who, who are underserved by existing financial institutions. Um, but one thing people often think about is, oh, it's decentralized, so maybe there's no financial crisis. Well, just because it's decentralized doesn't mean it can't crash. And all of it can come crashing down because it's so interdependent. So for example, if you take a look at Augur, um, Augur relies on Ethereum's price, which is how you get paid out. So if Ethereum's volatile, um, you can't do things like futures contracts. Um, the price of the rep token if the price of the rep token comes crashing down, um, the people who are incentivized to vote as oracles no longer have an incentive to vote honestly. Um, Augur relies on the Ethereum protocol's level of security. So any sort of economic attack at the protocol level, like a 51% attack can cause the underlying blockchain to fork and can cause um, all of Augur's 
prediction markets to go the wrong way. Um, and then there's a lot of smart contract security. You're relying upon um, smart contracts are holding $2.5 million. It's a honeypot for hackers. And of course, it's also relying on a couple of other assumptions, like one, that there are rational self-interested rep holders who will feed in information as oracles in the first place. And the second is that there is gonna be sufficient liquidity um, for this sort of trading. If there is no one who's willing to trade yes and no tokens with you, there's no way for you to continue making these bets. And so if any of these assumptions break, you can see how the system can come down crashing. And this is where I think there are a lot of open, interesting mechanism design problems. Um, a lot of assumptions that we have about the existing financial system still apply in this decentralized financial ecosystem. And there is a lot more risk because of this smart contract security. But there is also a lot of other tools that you have, which are cryptographic in nature. Um, so this is a start of a completely new field. You can call it token engineering, you could call it crypto economics, but this is a mix between cryptography distributed systems and mechanism design. And a lot of tools that we're gonna be building in the decentralized finance space require a combination of all of these cool tools. Um, but taking a step back and thinking about the ethics of building something like this, democratizing access to financial instruments means that we let people have access to things that only accredited investors could use. How does this play out? Like, what is okay for us to give normal people access to and what's not okay. Um, just like Augur can facilitate all kinds of prediction markets, it can also facilitate assassination markets. Um, the use of like zero knowledge technology will probably make it hard for us to even know if assassination markets exist. And there is a lot of thought that has to go in before you go ahead and build out these systems. Um, we expect that there has to be a lot more ethical and legal discourse around these tools. And while Mechanism Labs is a privacy and autonomy focused group, we would love to see a lot more discussion um, around the ethics of this and around um, the whole token engineering uh, mechanism design plus crypto economics as a new field. Um, I want to thank my co-founders, Zubin and Alexis, for helping me with this presentation. And thank you. All right, we've got time for uh, questions for any of the panelists. I think about this is at least for, for the public goods that we're building, these have to be long term sustainable. And um, the sustainability comes from the people that are involved. So, uh, a lot of my work is trying to recruit folks like that are in this audience to come and just be thinking about these problems and engage somehow. Um, in, in the decentralized uh, space, um, not only the hardware is decentralized, but the workers are decentralized. So, much like um, what Devin was saying yesterday about open source, but we don't really have terrific uh, tools for coordinating open source uh, developers yet. And so Ru the Rust community is an interesting community for, for how you organize themselves, uh, how they organize themselves. But um, this, this speaks to the governance problem that I said at the end. I think a big problem with our space specifically is, is very tied to how code gets deployed. And so we need to solve the governance problem Generally speaking, how do we make decisions about public goods so we can decide, well, is this piece of code going to be updated or not? Um, and, and frankly, all the uh, blockchains out there um, are pretty much a disaster when it comes to. 
code. An unsolved problem. Um, so I guess we've been trying a few different things. Um, so we started, we, we started what's called an open source blockchain research lab and tried a few different experiments where we tried to do research in an open source manner on GitHub. So usually when, when, when you write a research paper, a lot of the thinking and like a uh, lot taking and all of that happens, um, offline on a, on like in a classroom or something like that. Um, what we tried to do was have all the thoughts available on GitHub. And anyone who like thinks of new ideas just directly contributes on that form. Um, something that was, so another thing that we tried was using Telegram or other um, social media as channels for discussion um, on the different papers. And with any sort of new paper, anyone can take point and set up their own GitHub repository and you can have discussions on that thread. Um, one thing we found was that for writing papers, there isn't a great like collaboration tool as there is for um, coding. Like if you wanted to start a new coding project, you can just start it publicly and announce it to the world and anyone can contribute to it. But doing the same on GitHub with your paper makes it kind of messy. Um, and it doesn't provide the same functionality. So that's like something we found interesting, but um, we've recently been trying like other forms of community discussion, seeing what's worked well. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'm. I think I'm okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you to all the panelists. And this is a, 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 a quick brief comment to Arna and then look question. So I just moved from from London to the UK and uh, me. We went through all the process around GAR. Something felt implementation of that and not opted in rather than just put it from the get go. And concept of EPO, data privacy officers, quite sailing. Uh, so I thought, you know, it's something. Very curious to see how it is implemented and enforced. It, as for my own, where I, with my personal data, reach out to business in order to, from your record, given GDPR, of course, large companies provide the really yes, probably not, but of course, I'm trusting that they did because I have no comment building up on that. And Thought experiment is companies you're lodging your by category that how started to lead. I think that's a great question. Um, I don't think we're ever going to stop companies from activating their user base, their customer base, stratifying and, and applying tech to get purchase again. Uh, the, the thought experiment that I'm proposing, and again, it's, a, it's very much a sketch, is just for us to think about ways that we can get privacy and commerce to go together. Now, you can say that a large company could pull that off, um, but right now we wouldn't be able to credibly know what they're going to be doing with that data. Um, and and so I, I didn't. I tried not to use many buzzwords in, in my talk, but what I'm describing in that case are AI agents that are working on your data. And so when AI agents begin to work on large subsets of our data, it's un, it's unclear how we're going to be able to protect data. Uh -oh. Uh, for the gentleman in the, gentleman in the middle.
sealed bids, yeah. So both very good questions. So the first uh, answer to the first question is that's an unsolved problem, how AI are going to access the, this data. Um, and, and there are a lot of folks that are, are actually working in this. How do we create trusted enclaves for data to be running? And there are a number of technologies going out. So, I mean, you can look up trusted execution environments, which are basically uh, secure enclaves on chips that actually allow you to run arbitrary uh, kinds of data. So that kind of thing would work for uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, machine learning application. Um, zero knowledge proofs and zero knowledge uh, uh, executions uh, as is, a, is an emerging field. Um, those kinds of things could produce uh, answers to queries um, without revealing it. So, uh, that's something that is interesting for anybody technical, uh, is something worth looking at. And so zero knowledge proofs. Um, now, about your second question, um, in that thought experiment, so what I like about it is that it's a no regret type situation. So when I'm searching online for, for a product, I actually never know if I'm getting the best deal. And especially with travel, you, you never know if the price is going to change at some point or not. So in a, in a sealed bid kind of environment or Al Roth's uh, matching market, you, you, the, the design of it is you're trying to get the best possible match that, that can be done. So I, th I think it's just an interesting thought and experiment more than anything. Um, not not sure how you could actually go around implementing. Yeah. Thanks, Ben. Robin. Ananya, sorry. Uh, you, you talk about the organization wanting to be innovative in developing mechanisms and institutions. Have you talked about to what extent you would want to post the criteria by which you evaluate them in the sense of saying, we want mechanisms that do X and we're open to any suggestions that achieve X, or would you rather withhold an explicit declaration and just judge whether you like stuff? So, I mean, when we were, um, I, I actually had a very interesting conversation with Pop right in the beginning of when we were um, thinking about the, um, the, uh, the conference and how to, and how to imagine what's, what, this, uh, what this track would look like. And as I pointed out, there were two ways of going about this. Like one would be almost kind of reverse engineering the uh, the um, the the suggestions that Glenn and Eric had in their book, and then the other way was to actually be much more open uh, in terms of thinking about the kinds of resources we want to encourage. And I chose. Um, I mean, I think the, we we basically chose the second track because we are not, you know, um, we don't want to foreclose um, possibilities that we haven't imagined yet. Um, so in terms of um, gatekeeping, um, I would say that we don't really have a, um, a mechanism for saying, okay, we like these kinds of mechanisms and not that kind. I mean, part of it is, of course, like this is genuinely multidisciplinary. So when we were deciding on the papers, I, I drew upon a team of people that we have within the organization, um, economists, political scientists, legal scholars, to actually vet the submissions for the conference. So very much like any other academic conference, we had experts look at the submissions and then help us decide if they passed muster or not within the terms of the field. So, so that sounds like the second of the two options yeah, I gave. very much so. <laughs> Sir, yep. Um, thanks for this. The last comment that, that Aparna closed with takes me back to the very first comment that Atif made when he opened this conference. And I'd like to, to ask about that. When Atif opened, he, he underscored that public policy is how we choose how to organize ourselves. And we're going to be asking ourselves over these two days why we make those choices, what the results have been, and what else we can do. And <clears throat> it seems to me there's two different issues being raised by <clears throat> 
Aparna's presentation, which goes to what all of you are talking about, there's a difference between disintermediating a private profit-making enterprise, like, for instance, the investment banks that write the contracts for derivatives on the one hand, and disintermediating government, like, for instance, the SEC, whose job it is to put it in the regulations on accredited investors in order to protect people. So right now, our public policy, we have organized ourselves, society has organized itself in our democratic representative government by appointing an SEC, which is protecting accredited investors. And you raise very clearly, you know, the ethical issue that has to be dealt with in the current system. That ethical issue would be dealt with in the governmental process by the SEC, by, um, <clears throat> by, by proposing new regulations, possibly changing those, which frankly are outmoded and, and need to be changed. They've been around since 1933. Um, but uh, there's, there's a sense in all of the presentations on a focus on openness and, and decentralization. Is that necessarily disintermediating current forms of government and regulation? Or is it about encouraging them to change? Or is it about working within them as they are now? Um, I mean, this is a very open question that I think all of your companies are going to be facing. I'm interested in, in what you're thinking about that now and how you see it working within the, the current system that we have now for that feedback loop. First, oh, I can go first. Great. <laughs> um, so, how does decentralization change governance? I think is maybe at the heart of the question. Um, so, where I see, for example, blockchain having the biggest impact is perhaps on a lot of the public goods that governments uh, provide. So, there's a there's a number of, of use cases that are frequently talked about. Um, some of them, um, you know, might not, might not be workable, but I like the example of like a land registry uh, on the blockchain that could be decentralized. So if, if we could agree that the state is just, the, uh, just an arbiter, so just a referee in this, and we could have a decentralized group enforce uh, property rights uh, on the blockchain, that's, a, that's a, a situation where we are redistributing the power of, of being able to make claims, for example. So I do see that uh, in government, we're going to start seeing uh, use of, of blockchain. Um, so I guess the way I see it is I don't necessarily know if uh, blockchain and decentralization is about overthrowing existing power um, structures. It's more about providing a sort of structure, providing optionality that didn't exist until now. So for example, if right now I want to make a transaction in cash, um, there's a certain kind of privacy around it. Like if I go to a store, I don't have to reveal my information. Um, but if I had to do the same digitally and online, that's not a possibility. And I think what blockchain is essentially going to provide is this kind of optionality for people who are on the edges, for people who don't already fit in with the existing system. So maybe in the, in the sense of like private transactions, maybe in the sense of um, like people who have unequal access to financial resources. Like in some places in the world, it just does not make financial sense for banks or um, any sort of financial institutions to operate. But having blockchain provides them some other form of financial access. I think I'd like to ask a quick question to uh, Aparna and or Lucas as the technologists on the panel. Um, I, I think that if you, if you rewind to the 80s or the early 90s when the internet was first taking shape, we could see this um, very exciting sort of new public good emerging. Um, and I think at that time it would have been non-trivial to imagine the forms of uh, rent seeking that would uh, that would emerge on the on this new thing um, so how do we um, you know we, now we see new things on the horizon how do we even how do we begin to try to foresee the kinds of rent seeking that could emerge um, and is that even really the right way to think about it That's a really good question. I mean, to a certain degree, uh, these public goods that are created are rent-seeking institutions. 
but they're, they, they have no owner, they have authority. So they're seeking rent for themselves, distributing that within. So I don't, I, so I don't know if it's that, that's the best uh, term, but if we're trying to think of certain types of abuse that authorities could have on this or, or owners of capital could, could have on these systems, well, um, there's an interesting thing about blockchains in that they are open source and you can, um, uh, technical terms, you can fork them and you can fork the state of the chain and you can fork the code of the chain. So you have a number of cases um, where people are forking chains to be able to change the governance to, to uh, remove uh, uh, perceived um, rent seeking. So there's one case about of Zcash, Zcash is a privacy preserving cryptocurrency. Um, they, they, create, they increase the supply of their currency every so often and give that as a founder's reward to the founders that design Zcash. So there's a, a competing fork that's, that's forking Zcash and uh, making a, a version of Zcash with the same state and the same, and the same technology except without. So uh, blockchains, by being open, are somewhat resilient to, um, to activities that are not um, in the interest of, of a wider community. So I think it's it's an unusual institution for that reason. I actually think, um, so it's an interesting point that you brought um, where blockchains are open source and so people can fork away the code. But what people cannot fork away is the community and what makes blockchain or any sort of decentralized technology um, thrive is the community behind it. So any sort of like cultish, like, uh, behavior that you've created or any sort of like following for a certain group of people, certain sets of values, um, that cannot be forked away. Um, and so what's really interesting is like, even if you did build other technologies, but a, a much bigger community like forked away your code, um, there's no way for you to like take that back or like claim ownership because whatever this big community uses is then like, what gets accepted. Um, and so I think in a sense, there's there could be some kind of abuse around there, but that's that's to be seen. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think one more question and then it's time for us to get lunch. Atif. Maybe everyone can hear me. Um, so Anania, the last thing you mentioned, I thought was really interesting in terms of, you know, how to think of uh, collaboration um, and giving ownership of collaboration and so on. And so Devon is here, uh, uh, you know, we, we had this brief conversation yesterday about limitations of GitHub and, you know, that's one, something was pointed out. So I think that's a really an important um, idea. Um, I um, just wanted to, um, um, so, sort of uh, suggest other ways of collaboration as well that can be really useful in the academic uh, community. One is obviously the the, the ownership and co-authorship uh, model. Um, but the other one is, and we are thinking about this at the center that is doing the conference, because you know we, we, we want to go towards kind of an open source curriculum in the macro finance space that we want to work in. And I've been thinking about like what, how to, how to do it. And I actually, <laughs> I'm not sure I have an answer to that, but like we can do the first one, like we can post what we think is a useful starting point, but I would really like the macro finance community to get engaged in it and sort of to suggest in an open source way, new code, you know, new data to, and so on, but as well as new ways of teaching, uh, uh, as well as disagreeing, look, these topics are not the most interesting. I have these three additional topics that I think should be taught to someone who's interested in sort of learning more about the macro finance space. And so my broader, question or request is, you know, I mean, if we could develop platforms that really allow people to collaborate, it's something we really lack. You know, with this old model of I write the deep perfect textbook, I think that's gone. We really need to be able to collaborate to write, you know, new ways of teaching and understanding different topics and ideas. I think um, one of the most interesting possibilities that we'll, we'll be want to have, the, the commons um, is hopefully going to be a set of resources where um, the paper publishing part of it is one of it, but it's also a network, uh, a place that, you know, you can reach out to collaborators you wouldn't otherwise necessarily have um, had access to. Um, we want to create a hub for pedagogical resources. 
um, so that if you're interested, like the kinds of um, pedagogical experiments Liz was doing, then you know you could you could draw on that and you, for your own classroom. It's very much meant to be that kind of open source. One of the things that we're hoping that because this this it keeps an intellectual product on the platform, and there's a possibility of you know reopening that paper for discussion in light of new scholarship. So what we have is the possibility of creating an archive for an intellectual product and actually being able to map um, intellectual fields in potentially new ways and to identify lacuna research in new ways. So I mean, we're definitely thinking about all of these kinds of things. So I'm really open to people in different fields. I'm, I've been talking to colleagues in various schools and various disciplines. So anybody with ideas, please get in touch. We really, we really are interested in hearing about other, other mechanisms that could be useful. Thanks, everybody.